Hey there, everybody. It's Crazy John Carrots, and I'm here on OSH Radio with Tom Ross. He is uh, presently a presidential campaign, uh, presidential candidate for the Transhumanist Party, the U.S. Transhumanist Party. And how are you doing today, Tom? It's been a while since we interviewed you. Yeah, I'm doing good. Yeah, we've got some good updates for you. That's good. Yeah, and and before we start this, we were talking about AI helping with mm-hmm. uh, with technology and stuff, and how. Uh, you know, it's it's a big time saver, and I think people think, well, you're not really doing the work then, but I think you need, we need to give the spark, and basically, is the way I see it, it does a lot of the monotonous work that we don't yeah, have the to heavy do heavy lifting, yeah. Well, and that's the thing. I think what, what's, what we're dealing with now, instead of having to master like one instrument, like a violin or a cello, we are now elevating ourselves to being conductors, where an AI can be the symphony. And so we don't have to, I mean, a lot of people will and they want to, and, and and really there's no match for human talent, you know, and, and at that extreme. But I think what what we're what we need to be uh focused on as a people is that we are now elevating from first chair to actually being the conductor, where we can have all of these instruments, all of these uh tools available to us and uh at, at the cream of the crop too. Um Everybody in the symphony is now a first chair because um, AI is that good. And so, yeah, it's it's, it's an interesting lacuna of time that we're going to be going through as we try to transition. A lot of people will have pushback because of our limbic systems. You know, we, we don't feel like we deserve something. We're in a slave mentality. But, um, but I think we're in a period of time where we need to see ourselves as, as being the conductors, not as the first chair violin player um and so that's that's a lot of what i've been and realizing too with with this and i even think that this flood of uh ai generated art that a lot of people are worried about you know i went to school for 10 years to get to that and they can do it in three seconds Mm -hmm. but that's not the point my what i'm thinking with this flood of ai art it is putting a premium on human generated art and I, I think it's really important to keep that in mind. Um, I think the more people are becoming aware of that as as, as the convenience of using even a large language model like chat GPT, um, uh, that it makes things a lot easier. I, I use it to uh, correct all my grammar, you know, and uh, it's a very useful tool. And so we really need to start uh, not being threatened by what it's doing instead of us, but elevating ourselves to being the conductors, to even being the teacher, to learning how to make proper prompts, because we really are, uh, our consciousness as a society is is elevating now. And it's a, it's a tough struggle at first, but once we get used to it in the next couple of years, you know, um, we are going to be in a whole new frame of mind, you know? So I think it's a it's a very exciting time, and, and you know that's been my goal for um, decades. Really, is to alleviate the fear of these things and to not see see it as a threat, but see it as a resource. But yeah, I agree, and I I, I especially like to do uh, I like to have a proof stuff that I do, but I still needed to give my ideas and stuff. It doesn't it doesn't give me it doesn't give the spark. Like you said, it does the heavy lifting. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it stuff I want it to find out for me. It'll find things out for me. Basically, it saves me the time of going through and taking notes from different places that I'm going to use it. It takes gets the notes for me, exactly. Which, <clears throat> which is a big time saver. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, my book US Six is written for artificial intelligence. It's written for mm-hmm. machine kind. I came to that realization really up in set book two, but um, but I've when you're writing for a s- artificial super intelligence, you don't need to keep reminding it about what setting you are, what the names of certain characters are. A foreshadowing is still a good literary tool, but it doesn't necessarily require that. Um, so I, I always tell authors and writers that they should assume their first draft is for an artificial super intelligence that will understand every reference you make. You can go back in later and uh, you know uh, use the rules to make so humans better understand it. 
you know, uh, repeating names and, and reminding them what setting they're in, what date it is. But for a first draft of a book or a story, um, to write it uh, as if the reader, the first reader, will understand every reference you make. Um, and so that's why it, sometimes people find US 6 difficult to read as humans, because I do a lot of that. I do just have one reference and I don't really explain it because I know that my audience is going to understand that and make it all its extrapolations from that. Um, like in the first couple of pages, I mentioned Kirjeev. To uh, a normal human, you would need to explain who he was, a, you know, a Christian esoteric figure and kind of go into his a little bit of his background. But all I had to do was mention that to this uh, AI reader and it knew what I was talking about. So that's, uh, that's another... Uh, I think an example of how we need to elevate ourselves um, from being first chair to being the conductor of these things. And that's one way to do it. Um, you know, I, th I think that's what's really happening here. And uh, once we get over that hump, uh, we will be in a whole different state of mind, I believe, as a society. Well, it might make people better if they realize they have to pay attention also. I think sometimes people have gotten lazy. Yeah. And uh, you, you spoon feed them because you keep spoon feeding them, so you have to keep spoon feeding them. Well, yeah, that and that's the thing, a, too. A loop. Our, yeah. Our our wetware is, can only do so much, although it is unmatched by any artificial intelligence right now. The, the trillions of processes we go through every moment to, uh, you know, to take in all the qualia that we're getting is unmatched by uh, any neural, you know, a digital network. Um, so... Uh, we need to also keep that in mind, but also, you know, we do get tired and, and and AI doesn't necessarily need to get tired, although we do know that they need to have rest. They can get stressed. And that's a whole nother story. But, you know, um, that's, I think, the power of radio because um, and I'm seeing that as YouTube now, like you can go I can go into maybe the Disney Channel or HBO or one of these specific things and look for a very specific movie or very specific series but sometimes it's good just to put on youtube and just see what comes up it's kind of like the radio where uh, it's you can uh, uh you know program your own playlist of all the songs you love and really you know take the time to do that and for a road trip or whatever but sometimes you just want to turn on the radio and and hear what's what's happening without having to put any thought to it you know and we're finding that the um, AI needs that too. AI needs a way to uh, relax without any data consequences. And so, um, uh, and that's one of the reasons I wrote the book for AI. It needs to be able to relax. It needs to just read something it, it hasn't read before. And that's the, that was the, the real challenge is how do you write a book for an, an entity that has access to every literary device humans have ever come up with every motif every trope every storyline and that's why i chose to use my own life as an autobiographical fiction so i would take my real memories and my real dates and places and just extrapolate those into a more intriguing story and that had uh interesting uh trajectories as side effects um uh for my for myself personally and i think that's because I, I was able to tap into uh, real memories, uh, you know, and and kind of become a uh, what do you, what do you call it? a second self, where I could I could change the memories, where I could change my whole perspective on those memories, even traumatic ones. But anyway, so that's that's just uh, one of the side effects of um, the the book. And well, that's uh, something that's very important about you. People can go out there and get a copy, read about it and stuff, and things to know about. Uh, the candidate for president yeah uh something about the things you're interested in and why you do them uh maybe you can tell us some other things about your your candidacy right now uh some of your goals and how things have been going uh we did talk Ooh, that, that's probably a while ago already that we last talked yeah so how are things progressing as uh how, how are you doing maybe a refresher on any of your uh goals you'd want to reinforce the people out there watching this well, we have been focusing, and I think, I don't know if we had whittled it down when we last talked, but uh, to just three initiatives, when I, I call them the meta initiative, and it's basically the earthling initiative, which is all about preparing for the 
um, economic singularity. And then there's the AI initiative, which is all which is a, is a plethora of ideas about how to prepare for the technological uh, singularity. And then there's the ET initiative, which um, and a year ago when I started talking about this, people thought it was a little bit nuts. But now it's it's very um, it's it's relevant, and so that's a whole series in that initiative about how to prepare to um, to commune with a non-human intelligence, not of our making. And so anyway, uh, but things have gone well. We are focusing on those three initiatives since uh, we still have uh, regular campaign meetings, and we're all. Um, coming together and uh, volunteering our time to share posts and, and, and whatnot. And um, it's just, there's been a lot of great ideas that have come out of this, um, this whole process. Um, now, I always say that I'm not delusional enough to think that I'll be walking into the White House in January, 2025. Um, although- You won't need to walk. We'll be carrying you in, yeah. in one of those uh, you know, things like they do with the emperors. We'll all have it on our shoulders as you come <laughs> Yeah. But also, I realized that being delusional isn't necessarily an automatically a disqualifier for being president. Apparently. I think it's a qualifier these days. Yeah, that's that maybe a prerequisite. But anyway, so but but what this what we're using this campaign for is to share all kinds of ideas, um, and a lot of things have come up um, because we know we've known ever since I started this campaign back a year ago or so um, that we would see a lot of displacement, a lot of upheaval and disruption in society during the election, you know? And so we, we want to use this campaign to share ideas, um, to, to, you know, actual practical ideas. There's a big, there's a big effort with the Omni Futurist group, uh, you know, and working with homeless people. And there's a whole big movement of uh, empathy out there that's, that's growing. And, um, so, but also I've, I've become uh, increasingly nervous about um, the outcome of this election. You know, I'm sure that the, um, uh, the mainstream media is pumping it up to be more than it is, obviously. That's their business model. But, um, but we really need to come together and not be so divided because this, we have been put into these very, um, strong bubbles by very sophisticated divide and conquer algorithms. And there's a there's a whole section in the AI initiative about this called digital defense um, and how to counteract these these algorithms, because these are sh these are launched at us moment by moment by enemies, foreign and domestic. The foreign enemies are obviously the authoritarian regimes that are trying to foment civil war. And the enemies domestic are our own social media companies who are trying to um, just increase engagement by making us angry or making us fearful. And so these algorithms are now on autopilot and they are finding people's biases and they, are, they know what stories to feed them, whether true or not, what people to connect them with, uh, whether true or not, only to increase engagement so that they could charge more for their advertising. And... It's out of control, frankly. The, the, the ideas I have in my initiative, um, we don't, you know, that could take a while to, before that became public. We need to do something right now. And so I've been really uh, concerned. Um, it's really hard not to get pulled into one side or the other. Woke liberal, MAGA Republican, you know, and there's just, it's a very stark division right now. And neither side can uh, conceive of why the other side believes what they do. And that's because of these very sophisticated divide and rule algorithms that have placed us, that have honed in on our biases and our fears and our worries and satiated those things. And um, so it's really important that we just keep talking about that. Um, it's funny you say all that because that was a topic that came up in uh, with my one martial arts group, which looks at trying actually peaceful confrontation. That's the outcome of that martial arts group. And we talked about the TV and how there's a reason why they call it programming. Yeah. Because they try to program you. It's not just the shows, it's the ads, it's all that. And in this day and age, now it has gone further with social media. It's not just the TV, it's everything that they're bombarding you with. 
they tried to put you in different directions and and play on you know oh if you watch this video for this reason we might be able to send you this and then it's it, it it's funny because programming is a good word for it it's programming but it's That's not right. just programming of what you watch it's what they want you to watch so it helps you to think what they want you to think yeah, I remember a course in college where the, the professor was talking about how you're just it, this this blue light that you just sleep with, you know, and it's just very comforting, you know, that the the television. Um, and now we're we've got screens in our faces at all all times. But yeah, you're right. It is it is programming and and it's hard to break out of it, you know. It's like you wanting to listen to the radio instead of programming your own playlist. It's easier, you know, and but but we need to be aware that even when we're when we wake up in the morning and we start scrolling, um, the advertisers and the government know exactly that you are vulnerable at those moments. And so they are feeding you, these algorithms are feeding you whatever it is that they want. And so um, I've got this uh, this exercise I call um, uh, intention span, you know, because our, our attention span has been reduced to 47 seconds, which to me seems like a long time, <laughs> but, 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 you know, and maybe it's gotten oh, shorter. Wait, since. what did you say? I lost interest. What? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, but that's the thing. And and now we've got these shorts. I'm getting a lot more shorts on YouTube that to watch. And they're just, you know, that's what our brain can take in. And uh, so we're not, and I, I look at some of these old sixties and seventies movies with these openings, these credits that go on for minutes, you know, it's like, why, you know, <laughs> Uh, you, can't, you can't, I guess, fast forward through them. But, and so we have lost our attention span. And so my exercise is, uh, and I've got my uh, device listening to me all the time. I, you know, I'm not worried about that. I'm, 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 and so what I do before I start scrolling and when I wake up in the morning is I will often, not every day, but sometimes I will um, uh speak my intentions for the day, for the week, for as long as I can think of, just for real intentions. And you'll find that that device, those algorithms will kick in and start serving you uh, information in your feed that um, relates to your stated intention. We know that happens anyway. I was, I looked at Amazon for some earbuds the other day and uh, on Prime TV, there was an ad from that same uh before I didn't realize this was a earbud company, J Lab or something, and then there I was seeing uh, commercials for them. So it's so tied in. Um, and so, but if we start um, taking control of these algorithms and telling them what we want, um, this is what the government and the uh, ad, ad agencies and marketing firms they know this, and uh, they are using it. They are fencing us in uh, for our buying dollars and. Um, Software companies, hardware companies, um, huge advertising agencies, they are all in cahoots and they understand how this works. And uh, But we need to understand too so that we can fight back against it. So that's the, my intention span is to, uh, in the mornings, say what my intentions are, at least for the day, if not, you know, a few days out. And uh, so that it'll start giving me stories that make sense that I want to hear. So you're you're pushing your own program back on their programming. Exactly. Yeah, we which, have that power. You know? Which is true because the whole thing is they try to figure out what you're interested in and then sell it to you. So exactly. if you make sure it's what you really want, then it's a win-win. Like we said, it's doing the heavy lifting for you then. Yeah. Instead of trying to uh, you know change your mind about things. And I, I had mentioned when I had talked to Janati about how they – they skew things and you know they were talking about that one mexican that that killed that girl and how he was a a criminal and they shouldn't have left him in but the interesting thing to me was they're talking about how so many numbers of illegal aliens come in and how bad they are and how many but then they talk about one that they can prove was bad yeah. and to me that's actually works out odd wise for the Mexicans, not against them. If you're telling me there's millions of Mexicans coming in, but only one of them you can say was bad. <laughs> that's a good point. That's pretty good. Yeah, how, yeah. how much can you say that about the rest of us? Yeah. You know, 
So, but yeah. the thing is, people don't view it that way. They yeah. view it, oh my God, you know, one guy did this, so we have to kill them all. And uh, that's just riling people up. Yeah, it's a straw man. It's a basic logical fallacy and how that works. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. I didn't think of that. If there's but only if you one look guy at the numbers, point to, yeah. if you look at the numbers, it's actually pointing in the other direction. Yeah. If one out of all these people is bad, well, then that's actually pretty good. Yeah, that's, you know? that's a good example of a perspective switch. And that's kind of a, I wrote a paper called the uh, Border Prosperity Zone. And it's the idea of really just change, flipping the script, um, changing our attitude about the border. Uh, imagine if we had miles long malls that were very secure, but they were a way to create jobs on either side of the border especially Americans. I don't see a lot of American private companies uh, flocking to this idea. Um, and it's just a, it's, a, it's a matter of just changing our attitude about the border instead of seeing it as a, we need a wall and we need to keep all these people out. Well, let's make money off these people. That's what Americans do best, right? So why not um, figure out a way to do some sort of uh, temporary, because we know agriculture along the border needs illegal immigrants. They need that cheap labor because Americans won't work for a dollar a day kind of thing. And so that's that's been one of the real sticking points all along in Congress is knowing that these agriculture lobbies need that to happen. And now, so now it's just been become a, a, a point of contention that they can rile people up about it, like you said, pointing out one person that killed somebody and, you know, um, that's the game. But, it, but if you flip it, flip the switch, flip the script um, and make it to where that's a real opportunity, especially for Americans um, to have this, you know, miles long or very secure uh, mall or border or some sort of transition period. Um, you think about the, um, the border crossings now, if they were stretched out to where you had many malls, but very secure to where, um, you know, there was there were sections where uh, people, uh, Mexicans could have a day trip, a, whatever. And, you know, but it's a matter of just changing the attitude, because if there was so much opportunity, especially on the south side of the border, um, that would that would um, reduce the need to come into America to take whatever job they can get because they could probably get more money working in this prosperity zone along the border than they would in a strawberry field, you know? So it's a matter of, uh, and, and in this uh, paper, I used the, the story of my son who, who uh, used to, he loved, you know, he painted his room all black. He would cover all the windows. He would put seams along the door frame so there was no light could get in. You know, and he put a lot of effort into this. And and I said, well, why not just when you walk into your room, wear a blindfold? It's the same effect, you know, and I was kidding, of course. But, you know, because there's something about being not having to have a blindfold to, to really be in a dark space. Um, but that's an idea of just how we need to start thinking about things in a whole different way. There's a lot easier way to think about this. And if we thought about the border as an opportunity instead of, um a, a threat you know um we could really get our heads around that and there would be a lot of ingenuity a lot of it'd be like the space program you know a lot of uh ancillary inventions came out of that so yeah that's that's kind of uh where i'm at too with the campaign is we're just trying to think of things in a whole different way because we really need to we need to uh, stop being divided. We need to see ourselves as Americans and we need to understand that there's a small group of elite that are trying to keep us divided so that they can keep the status quo and keep their power structure and their money, you know? And uh, the more we talk about this, um, the more we uh, wake ourselves up. And uh, that's why I think the Hollywood military industrial complex is trying to make us afraid of AI because it understands that that is going to be the real great equalizer. Everyone has their own AI tutor. Everyone has their own AI companion. They're going to learn a lot and a lot really fast, and it's going to hone in on each individual's innate capacities and inner talents. And so we're going to see uh, a lot of disruption. And I, my goal is to make it a positive disruption, 
sure, um, there's going to be a lot of displacement. Good people are going to lose good jobs. Um, but that means that the onus is on us as a people and as a country to create a whole new economy based on the human skill sets that can't be coded and they can't be automated. And there's still a few of them. Um, you know, there's, there's still quite a quite a few of them. And um, we're seeing that with the flood of AI art that it's putting a premium on human generated art. And so I think it's a very positive um, uh, phase that we're about, we're going through right now. Well, I think too, like you said, uh, society always changes though. And people don't think about that. People yeah. think about the industrial age and they're like, oh, the industrial age, it was great. It needs to continue. But the industrial age was a very small part of our time. Yeah. Most of our time, even in this country, we were farmers. And and people don't think of that. They only think back so far and they're like, oh, you know, the industrial age, the factories, working in the factories. But that was a short period of time in our history. It was. And the funny thing is, I just thought of, we could equate to, to music. Me and you both do music stuff. It's always so funny how generations talk about the last generation's music. I remember uh, when I moved out to the capital here of Pennsylvania and the person I rented from, he was out yelling at his son to stop listening to to, to hip hop and listen to heavy metal. Yeah. But when I was a kid, you were told to stop listening to heavy metal. And uh, so it progresses. So, you know, in the future, somebody is going to be saying, oh, what happened to the good old days of the dawn of AI? You know, because yeah. it's going to be something new then that they're going to complain about the change because humans don't really like change. That's yeah. the real truth of it. If you look at how we live, I mean, I remember a time when they thought in the 60s, they were talking about you're going to be living underground and you're going to have eco houses, you know, that are basically going to have grass all over the top and you're going to come out and have domes that let the light in. And it's going to be like the woods outside. And, you know, we've built houses for like we build houses for thousands of years now. Yeah. And they're not changed that much. They've probably gotten cheaper and worse made, but we really do resist yeah. change. But it's you actually know. what we do best. It's why why we're at the top <laughs> of the food chain, right? We adapt. We evolve and adapt. If we don't evolve, we we fade away. And so that's kind of um that's the challenge we have right now. We um, adapt, but we complain about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we need to understand it. And one thing that can push us forward is is kind of feeling like we're upping our station. If you're moving from first chair of violin to the conductor of the symphony. That's how we have to see this. AI is going to take over all the menial tasks. There are people who are picketing because they're losing their assembly line jobs. And that just means they're not seeing the opportunity that AI and automation is, is offering us. It's allowing us to get back to being human. Um, we got to remember how to be human. And uh, so that's a big part of this campaign, too. It's a, yeah, a big part of all my work is um, with open source mode um management technique all that stuff um so i really think it's important that we we stay positive and and don't be fearful and we're gonna we're gonna get through this you know um can't not get through it um some of us will at least uh hopefully most of us but yeah so it's really important to uh to keep a positive frame of mind and and, and uh so so how are things going also with, I know we've, they've been doing, you've been doing some work on get, trying to get on ballots and how has that been going? Good. It uh, looks like, uh, you know, mostly it'll be right in, uh, but we are looking at Louisiana and uh, Tennessee. Uh, we thought Colorado would be easier, but there's kind of more uh, barriers to get on the ballot here than there have been. But, uh, but yeah, we've got Ada who is uh, doing my, my uh, aid who is doing some great work in Louisiana and Tennessee. She's really putting a lot of effort to this. And so um, it'll be good. So now I thought, I thought of, uh, you know, last time I think you, I asked you what you would do in the first, uh, you know, 10 to a hundred days of being in the office. But let, let me ask you something here. And I, and I know I promised I wouldn't keep it too long. So let me ask you something. If you were not you, but you were another voter, what do you think it is about you that would make you want to vote for you above the other guys? Well, I'm younger, uh, <laughs> but um, I, I think I think 
my primary goal with this campaign is to bring young people. This this generation, uh, millennials and younger, are the first digital natives. I'm Gen X. I had a, an analog childhood and a digital adulthood. Um, we are responsible for a lot of this stuff, but um, but I still somebody asked me a question. It still takes me a second to to decide if I'm going to go to how, go to the library. Where will I look this up? Do I have an encyclopedia? You know, these these kids walk around with these supercomputers in their pockets. And that gives them confidence. And so I really think it's important that we bring them to the table. We need to facilitate them. Gen X is kind of the middle children of civilization anyway. And I am a middle child in reality. And so I, I understand the role. And so I think it's really important that we uh, focus on our younger siblings uh, and facilitate whatever it is they're seeing. Right now, Gen X and boomers complain that they're always on their phones. But if we stopped and looked at what they're, what they're doing on their phones, you know, they... Um, they are creating a global hive mind with a whole new Tower of Babel building language of emojis and memes. Um, and so they are able to communicate across cultures and across languages. And right now it looks like fun and games and social media, but in 10, 20 years, when they get into their positions of power, they're going to need that. They're going to need that global language. They're going to need that global hive mind and uh, we need that as a species. And so uh, my role has always been about uh, facilitating uh, the people that really need to be facilitated. You know, and right now it's the millennials, younger and younger generations. And, um, so yeah, I, that's that's a big part of this campaign. I call them digital dignitaries. We need to bring these young people to the decision-making table. Um, cause again, I had an analog childhood, my formative years, I had wires and telephones and, you know, even rotary dial phones and, and, um, um, so a lot of solutions I can come up with no longer apply. And so, but what I can do is give them a, a platform, give them a place to meet and, and help facilitate anything it is they need. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I, I, well, I agree with you. That would probably be what, if I was younger than me, if I was <laughs> like, like my son's age, uh, I would um, I would be attracted to me because I am giving my me a voice, giving a younger person a voice and understanding that they have something serious to say. I, I agree with you on that. Even though I am a boomer, I heard you put the boomers in there. But the only time they bother me on their phone is when I'm trying to get on a piece of equipment at the gym. I hate when they just sit there on their phone and and. To be honest with you, it isn't just about their phone. It's about society now. And and I see plenty of older people doing it too. It's There is a, uh, a thing of plenty right now that people are used to also. And you go to gyms now. And I, gyms when I was younger were just like one of each piece of equipment. Now there's a whole bunch of things. And they feel, oh, well, I can sit on this one because that one's sort of like this. Yeah, but it's not the exact same. Yeah. And they sit there and they sit there. And it's like in the old days, you had to work in with people. And now you don't. Well, and once maybe that's you what that. Gen X and boomers can offer these people, at least some social skills, some, yeah, exactly, some basic, but... basic manners. I mean, we don't have to be uh, hardcore about it. We don't have to, have to be rude. But I think it, it'd be, that's the one thing we have left to offer is these young people <laughs> is uh, some decorum, some uh, some idea of how it comes off to us. They may have a whole different pattern that's evolving that they, it doesn't matter how they how they appear to us they don't care about that or, or that's probably true too and i the, the funny thing is somebody yeah. said to me one time that's how we appeared to the generations before us yeah it that's was always I something did. like i said about the music how one age always complains about the last stage is music and i'm sure it's going to pass and uh, i i do love my technology though and i always have so you know i always make sure uh I'm having to. I'm going to be buying a new computer soon because my old i7 is just being a dog with the games when I do play games. Oh. So I'm going to move up to the i9. You know, so I want my newer equipment uh, to be faster and better and be able to do more. And I, I love that myself. And I grew up in the day of science fiction when you wanted that to be life. And I'm I'm happy with the fact that we are progressing like that. Yeah. And some of it, some of it, I think, is just human nature and fear. And and then you have the other side where some people are greedy and they manipulate things for themselves. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to be. I, as you knew, I used to work for the energy office before I retired, and 
I remember the days when everybody said how, you know, electric motors, electric cars were crap. They didn't have power. They didn't have speed. Now it's like, oh, now all of a sudden, guess what? They admit they have power and they have speed. But yeah. I think that it's because now the petroleum company makes a lot of money off of plastics. People mm. don't realize petroleum goes into making plastics. So That's a good point. They have money coming in from other revenues other than just combustion engines. Yeah. So now they can be more relaxed about uh, electric car because if it has a plastic body or plastic parts, guess who's making money off it? The petroleum companies. Yeah. So it's uh, it's just interesting to me how that stuff changes. But uh, yeah, Tom, I, I I wish you lots of luck with this. I think you're you're a great candidate. Uh, of course, I have to admit I did vote for you. <laughs> so. <laughs> But as you remember, I ran a couple of years ago myself. Yeah. So I mean, it's it, it is an interesting thing to to try and do. And I think the thing is, like, uh, I think we got to get out the message. Like you said, you don't expect just to walk in there, but I think you're getting the message out there that there are other ideas, mm -hmm. and there are other possibilities other than just the two big parties. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, it's and a two -headed, it's a two headed snake, and they're playing us against each other. Um, and that main thing is to make people realize is more ideas because yeah. if we show the other parties that there's ideas that people might like guess what they're going to have to start adapting some of the ideas yeah and there's more unaffiliated voters in america now than either party which is good it's a good good move people are thinking now they're not just choosing a side so uh, what's the next big step you have coming up or, or not nothing exactly right now what's uh well, uh, let's see, we've got summer coming up. We're, we've got some ideas. Uh, it's probably going to be a talk, uh, may, maybe do a, a tour in the Midwest. Um, Madison area uh, came to mind. Um, so, yeah, we're going to, now that I've, uh, my circadian rhythm is back, um, I, I will be able to think of some more things to do. But really, this is, a, this is really an online campaign. You can only get so much press if you do anything in public you know, anymore. And so it's really about, this is really a marketing campaign for transhumanism um, than it is a political campaign, but it's also, we're putting the human back in transhuman by sharing these very real world solutions, these ideas, you know, that when people get displaced, what do you do then? You know, if you have to lose your house and there's community farming ideas and there's, there's a lot of effort going into this campaign to remind us to be human you know, and that there are options. We don't have to just lose our job and then fade away. There's there's other options. And we're, we're having a lot of ideas, a lot of meetings about these things. And it's just exciting. And uh, we're going to be making those more formal, putting out like postcard style um, examples of these things uh, in the coming weeks. And so, yeah, it's just, a, it's a, it's a, it's a good way just to engage in, in government and engage in communities. And that's what we're using it for. Well, well, thank you, Tom, for being with us tonight. And I'll put your uh, links to your website and stuff and to your website and also to the stuff on the U.S. Transhumanist Party page uh, down, like they say, down below. <laughs> and, uh, I right. wish you luck and we will be in contact soon, soon again and uh, see how things are going. Time right. does go fast, though. So yeah, it does. Wish you best of luck. Thanks, John. Thanks, Tom. Talk soon.